Hey, what you reading for? Vampires hijacking a steamboat on the Mississippi. A young boy climbing a mountain of bones to conquer his fear of death. Jane Fonda reminding us to breathe. And a bitter sequel to a beloved classic. This is 1982, the year in horror. Don't forget to breathe. Six, seven, eight, and twist. Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel where I talk about books, literary horror, classics, and contemporary. Today is the third installment of my 10-part video retrospective on a horror from the 1980s where I go year to year picking out three titles that uh, look appealing to me. I read them with fresh eyes and report back to you with my honest opinions. In 1982, if my memory serves me right, uh, big if, my family and I, we had just moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. At this point, we had been living in the United States for about two years. I was beginning to lose my French accent and I was looking forward to going to a new school where the kids presumably would call me Michael instead of Michel, like they did at my old school. Even though my name is not Michel, even when I was in France, it was not Michel, it was Mikael. But apparently uh, for Americans, uh, the name Michael is in France is always Michel. I don't know. Unfortunately, when I got to my new school, a popular television commercial from the early 1970s was making a resurgence wherein um, Mikey's mates would gleefully proclaim, Hey, Mikey! Let's get Mikey! Yeah! He won't need it. He hates everything. He likes it! Hey, Mikey! When you bring life home, don't tell the kids it's one of those nutritional cereals you've been trying to get them to eat. You're the only one who has to know. So I was not called Michelle at my new school. Um, I was not called Michael either. Kids are the worst, aren't they? I was too young for horror in 1982. I would discover horror in the latter part of the decade with Clive Barker books and David Cronenberg on VHS. So this look a, back into uh, horror in the 1980s is a new experience for me. One I enter into with a certain amount of skepticism. There was a lot of bad horror written in the 1980s, but I am determined to wade through all that unpleasantness and hope to find a few 80s horror gems that I know exist. If you're new here, consider subscribing. It's a simple click of the button, but it does help the channel and it helps me stay motivated to keep putting out content and I do appreciate the support. I'll run a short uh, intro sequence featuring some cool horror book covers from horror books put out in 1982. See if you can guess which three I picked out to read. I'll give you a hint. Um, Hollywood, Mississippi, and asthma. Enjoy the montage. I'll see you on the other side to talk books. In 1982, E.T. the Extraterrestrial was the number one movie, and Physical by Olivia Newton-John was the number one song. And building off the success of Pac-Man in 1980, where a big mouth 
runs around a maze popping pills while being chased by ghosts, and Donkey Kong in 1981, where players climb ladders while being chased by barrels. In 1982, we decided to combine the two and have players run around a maze climbing ladders while being chased by peppers in a race to see if they can step on all the food before being overcome by evil sentient capsicums. As if being chased by peppers and getting physical with neon glowing Australian pop singers weren't scary enough, 1982 also gave us eventual horror classic movies such as Poltergeist and The Thing. But what about horror books? Well, to be honest with you, as I'm going through lists of books that were put out in the 1980s and I'm making tentative plans as to what I'll be reading for each year, for some years, the choice is relatively easy. But some years, like 1987 and 1988, for example, it's difficult to find uh, three titles that look particularly appealing to me. 1982 has probably been the most difficult year to select titles for. My first two attempts at reading horror from 1982 were fails. First, I tried Slugs by Sean Hudson. I figured it would be shocky, gory, silly fun right? Uh, being attacked by um, blood-sucking snails. That sounds like fun, right? And maybe it is. I don't know. I DNF'd this book after about 20 pages. I was not expecting a literary masterpiece, but the writing was just too weak and too sloppy, and I, I couldn't make it past the first two chapters. Next, I tried Ancient Lights by Davis Grubb. I was uh, intrigued by this because uh, Davis Grubb had a huge hit in the 1950s with Night of the Hunter, and the synopsis of Ancient Lights, it looked interesting, so I decided to check it out. And Ancient Lights is a unique book, definitely worth talking about, but it's not horror. It's an example of a book that uh, was written by a horror author, and because of the author's name, it just automatically gets labeled horror, even though it most obviously isn't horror. So I fell for that trap. But I'm going to talk about Ancient Lights in another video. Uh, it just, it's not horror, and so it doesn't belong here. So my third attempt at reading horror from 1982 was a success? I read Phantom by Thomas Tessier. I had never read Thomas Tessier before. I almost read his 1979 offering Nightwalker for my uh, retrospective on horror from the 1970s, but at the last minute I opted for something else in its place. So here I figured I have another chance to read his work, and if I don't take this chance now, I probably never will. Phantom is about a young boy, Ned. I believe he's 10 years old. His mother suffers from an asthma attack that nearly kills her. The family, they move to Virginia, or West Virginia, one of those, where Ned confronts his fear of death or as he calls it, uh, the phantoms that come in, out of nowhere and take you. That might sound dark and heavy, but ultimately it plays out like a boy who is afraid of the dark. He's afraid of shadows, to the extent that all young kids are. Until uh, one night he has a panic attack where either his mind takes him to a fantastical place to play out his fear of the dark, or maybe phantoms really do 
come and take him and lead him to death. I was not super enthusiastic to read this um, because the protagonist is 10 years old. I was uh, afraid that it might be uh, YA horror and I'm really trying to avoid YA horror for this retrospective, but avoiding YA horror in the 1980s is not always easy. Um, the protagonist is 10 years old. Uh, I found it a relatively, or a, an easy read. It's quite light on the horror. And the themes that it talks about are relatable to a young reader. So I think in that respect, it could be appropriate for young readers. <clears throat> However, the pacing is quite slow. So I would think that a young reader would find the pacing quite frustrating. As an older reader, uh, I think the story works. Uh, I did like the characters. The kid, he spends uh, a considerable amount of time at a rickety bait shop with two old jobless country folk. And the friendships he develops with these two characters uh, works really well, I think, and it was uh, enjoyable to read. I have met several people who love fishing and they love reading about fishing. So when they come across a book that has fishing in it, they get all excited, right? So this book has fishing in it. And I think it's done, uh, I think it's done quite well. In fact, I think the fishing is probably done better here than in uh, John Langan's uh, 2016 horror book, The Fisherman, uh, for what that's worth. Ultimately, it was too light on the horror to satisfy me. Towards the end of the book, we're given a phantasmagoric passage where Ned is led through a gory landscape, uh, which leads to the climax of the story. And whenever I come across a scene like this in a book where a character or characters are led through a gory, fantastical landscape, I can't help but compare it to Clive Barker. Clive Barker is my reference for fantasy. He's immediately what I think of when characters uh, go through uh, fantastical, gory landscapes, such as Magica or Everville, or uh, the tour of hell we are given in the Scarlet Gospels. Uh, and when it comes to uh, world building, that mixes the gorgeous with the grotesque, no one does it better than Barker. So it's not fair to compare uh, Tessier's phantasmagoric passage with the work of Clive Barker, but I, I can't help it. And so when I finished reading uh, Phantom, it left me uh, wanting to revisit Clive Barker, but that doesn't come till the latter part of the decade. Ugh. All in all, Phantom works. It's pretty good. It was tamer and younger than I would prefer, but I'd be open to reading another book by Thomas Tessier. Phantom wasn't bad. Large muscles in your thighs and hips are forcing greater volumes of blood to your heart, which in turn strengthens the heart muscle. And that's why these exercises are cardiovascular. It's important to keep breathing. Last time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Jumping jacks. Next up, I read Psycho 2 by Robert Block. Now, I loved the original from 1959. It made my list of top 10 horror books of all time. The story behind the sequel is pretty interesting. Apparently, uh, Robert Block got word that the studio was planning on making a sequel, and he was uh, a bit concerned about what they were going to do to his property, to his characters, to the story. So before the studio could get a script approved, he went ahead and put out his own sequel. Uh, the studio didn't much care for it, so for the movie, they went in a completely different direction. If, you, if you've seen the movie uh, Psycho 2, I think it's excellent, by the way. Uh, 
Uh, it's, it works both as a sequel or as a standalone. And uh, it takes, it gives a new or a fresh perspective on the story, on the character. The book is a different animal. In the book, Robert Block takes the story to Hollywood, where a movie studio is planning on making a movie adaptation of the crimes uh, perpetrated by Norman Bates. So in this book, uh, Robert Block takes a few not-so-veiled stabs, pardon the pun, at uh, the movie industry in Hollywood. So that part of the book is, is fun, and it's meta, uh, especially when you take into account the, uh, the backstory of the book. Whereas the movie has Norman Bates released from the mental institution because he's supposedly been cured, the book takes a very different approach to getting Norman Bates out of that setting. And that part I thought was done very well. I had a strange reaction when uh, reading this book. Just seeing the name Norman Bates and just the fact that a doctor was uh, talking about him or talk, then talking to him, Norman Bates, it, it got me all excited. Uh, it was strange. And uh, I loved the first few chapters of this book. It was quite, uh, it was quite slashery and fun. But then, what the book doesn't do well is that it fails to capitalize on what made the original so popular and so iconic. We never go back to Bates Motel. In fact, in this story, uh, Bates Motel uh, had burned down uh, years ago. Instead, we go to Hollywood, to a movie set, um, and we focus on the doctor who is trying to find Norman Bates because he believes that Norman Bates uh, went to Hollywood to try to put a stop to the movie production. So this book, there's, there's no Bates Motel, there's no swamp, and there's very little Norman Bates, actually. So while I really enjoyed the first few chapters, ultimately, I, I thought the book was weak and disappointing. Uh, if you're a fan of the original, like I am, I think you can skip this sequel. Although the movie sequel, I think, is really good and worth checking out. Sure your left shoulder is back and that you're pulling down straight to the side with your hips forward. And for my third read, I read Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin. I had never read George R. R. Martin before. I was familiar with the name because of Game of Thrones. I've never seen that series. But I figured, well, the opportunity is here. I might as well check out one of his horror books. Fever Dream is a vampire story. I'm not, um, I'm not really a fan of vampires. Uh, I liked Dracula, but that's probably the only vampire book I've ever read, unless you want to count I Am Legend, which I also liked. So the fact that Fever Dream is a vampire story, that almost put me off to reading it. But because of the name George R. R. Martin, I decided I'd give it a go, and I'm very glad that I did. Fever Dream takes place in the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, the story spans a few decades. It's set on the Mississippi, where a vampire goes into business with a steamboat captain, and together they build and run a large, lux luxurious steamboat for freight and passenger transport along the river. A few weeks ago, if you had asked me, Michael, how do you feel about steamboats? You may have been underwhelmed uh, at my 
lack of enthusiasm for the subject. Now you ask me how I feel about steamboats and I'm all in. After reading Fever Dream, I would consider myself a steamboat enthusiast. Fever Dream does an excellent job infecting the reader with the character's passion for steamboats. The, their construction, their operation, uh, the steamboat life, right? With the dangers and the risks and the hard work that comes along with it and the bravado of steamboat men, right? As for the horror, uh, Fever Dream deals with um, classic vampires. The religious aspect has been removed from the lore, so holy water and crosses don't work on them. But other than that, you, they're, they're your um, standard classic vampires, um, quick healing, blood sucking night walkers, right? On the downside, for me personally, uh, the vampires in this book, they have a moral compass. What I mean is that there are some good vampires and some bad vampires which I wasn't too crazy about that. I prefer the vampire as an amoral beast. The concept of a vampire with a conscious, for me, that I find that less appealing. Also, it's worth mentioning that this story takes place in the south of the United States in the 19th century. So there is slavery. And while the author and some of the characters are clearly anti-slavery. Some of the characters are for slavery. And we do get scenes with slaves and how they are treated. Um, so that uh, that's a trigger warning worth mentioning. Ultimately, I quite liked this book. Um, it was well written with a decent amount of blood and action. There wasn't any romance or sex which I would expect from a classic vampire story. In fact, there were hardly any female characters at all, aside from a minor female vampire. Um, while this book did convert me into a steamboat enthusiast, it didn't exactly turn me into a fan of vampires. If I never read another vampire, vampire story again, I'll, I'll be perfectly fine with that. On the other hand, if you are a fan of vampires, I would give Fever Dream a very high recommendation. Also, if the idea of uh, the setting of Mississippi, the Mississippi River in the 19th century, if that setting uh, appeals to you, I think you'll really like this book as well. I'm not uh, especially eager to read another book by George R. R. Martin. I mean, I'm glad I read this one. Uh, and if the right book comes along at the right time, I certainly won't be opposed to it. And inhale. Exhale. You did a great job. Don't you feel good? It was tough for me to pick three horror books to read for 1982, but I think I did a pretty decent job. You know? I have already read for 1983, and that was another tough year of slim pickings. <clears throat> but things do pick up significantly in 1984. Do you have any memories of 1982? Did you play Burger Time? Do you have any experience with any of the authors or books I talked about in this video? I always enjoy reading your reactions and feedback in the comments section. If you don't have any feedback, uh, you can always stop by and say hi. I always enjoy hearing from you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in 1983.